Welcome to Energy and Utilities Market Talk, the latest platform brought to you by Informer Markets to keep you up to date with news, expert commentary and analysis on the global energy sector. This is a special edition of Energy and Utilities Market Talk, brought to you in conjunction with Global Energy and Utilities Digital Week. The Digital Week is bringing together more than 500,000 energy professionals from across the world to provide leading content, debate and solutions for companies and clients across the energy supply chain. The theme for the week is powering the world into a new energy era, focusing on opportunities and challenges of successfully implementing clean energy programmes and improving efficiency of conventional power resources in the post-COVID-19 world. According to the latest data from IRENA, the International Renewable Energy Agency, the total installed capacity of renewable energy increased by 7.6% in 2019, with 176 gigawatts of new clean energy capacity installed during the year. The new installed renewable energy capacity increased the clean energy share of all power capacity globally to 34.7%, up from 33.3% at the end of 2018. However, if the target set out in the Paris Climate Accord are to be achieved and the global average temperature increase kept below 2 degrees Celsius, much more needs to be done. The challenge of successfully delivering on targets to reduce carbon emissions, improve efficiency and increase the development of renewable energy has become much greater in 2020 with the COVID-19 outbreak. Global economic growth is likely to fall much further than in 2008 when the financial crisis struck. And with the latest forecast from the IMF predicting a a contraction of the global economy by at least 3%. The disruption to supply chains and the fall in demand for services and products across the globe is resulting in an unprecedented challenge for governments and energy companies. However, while the impact of the COVID-19 outbreak has created onerous short-term challenges, it is also providing an opportunity for the public and private sectors to prioritise sustainable policies and green initiatives to assist and spur on the recovery. I caught up with three of the experts participating in the Global Digital Week to ask them about the impact of COVID-19 and how they saw the pandemic playing out and what impact it would have on the development of sustainable energy across the world. First of all, I caught up with Amit Jain, Senior Energy Specialist from the World Bank. I asked him, will COVID-19 and the resulting economic challenges help or hinder the development of clean energy? If you look at the current pandemic situation, I believe it is an opportunity for carrying out reforms in the whole energy sector. Let me give you some of the real international developments in the area of clean energy sector during these pandemic times. Now, India. India has released draft electricity amendments, which are going to be revolutionizing in the clean energy sector. The Ministry of New and Renewable Energy has signed more than 20 gigawatts of solar and wind projects in the last five months alone during this pandemic time, which include some of the innovative projects like round the clock, hybrid projects, green shoe options, which are linked to manufacturing. India also achieved a lowest PPA price of 3.2 US cents in the last six months. Germany has come out with a large green stimulus plan with a focus on hydrogen and clean energy. And Korea has issued more than $700 million of green bonds. The point I'm trying to say is several countries has come out with innovative financial policies to promote clean energy. And they're using this crisis time to bring out large sector reforms. Australia has announced major status to a project connecting 10 gigawatts of solar park from Australia to Singapore via undersea cables. I then asked Amit, what are the key challenges facing Asian countries in developing renewable energy? And what role can multilateral financial institutions play in helping countries transition to cleaner forms of energy? It's very plain and simple. Any investor wants assured returns for its investors. If I invest a dollar in the market, I want some returns and I want assured returns. For this, investors sign the PPA for renewable energy projects. Now, in the last four and five months, the utilities who sign PPAs are facing serious troubles. First of all, 
the demand of electricity has gone down. As you can imagine, there is no on-ground activity in commercial and industrial sector, so demand is going down. Secondly, the collection efficiency of these utilities have also gone down tremendously. This puts a tremendous pressure on the utilities to pay back and honor the PPAs in time. And there's a huge off-taker risk in the Asian countries to make the payments of PPA. In India specifically, you must have heard that there has been renegotiation of PPA in several states which are threatening existing and new projects. In small countries like Maldives, which are heavily dependent on tourism, they are investing more and more on renewable energy. But because of this pandemic, there is a very big fiscal hole in their budget, which is forcing them to concentrate on reviving the economy, which I think can be best done by focusing on sustainable energy. And let me give you a very small example of SRMI, which is called Solar Risk Mitigation Initiative, initiative of the World Bank, and we have partnered with International Solar Alliance. IVENA and AFD. I mentioned two or three challenges in the previous questions. One is the off-taker risk. The off-taker risk can be in the form of a termination. If a utility terminates the contract, it could be in the form of a delayed payment. Now, with the government of Maldives, on these principles, we worked out a three-tier framework where you have a letter of credit in case there's a delay. Second, we have an escrow account for six months delayed payments. And finally, we have the World Bank guarantees to backstop if there are any termination. Maldives is planning to sign a five megawatt project next month on these principles. These are innovative financial structures, which are the need of the hour in these pandemic times, where we could help take care of these off-taker risks, which are very prominent in these times. Finally, I asked Amit, what are the key regulation enablers and policies that can spur on the development of clean energy? This is a very important question. While you and me could be a big fan of renewable energy, the main motive of the government across the country right now is to create jobs and to kickstart the economy, which will remain the driver for regulatory and policy and labor. Now, I believe there are two sectors which are key in creating green jobs. One is MSME, the medium and small enterprises. And secondly is manufacturing, because these are the two critical sectors which can jumpstart the economy and also create millions of jobs at the same time. I truly believe that green jobs is the way to go. For example, the MSME sector is struggling right now. Although there's a clear case of solar rooftop and MSME, but nothing is happening on the ground because MSME sector has a poor case of credit history. So lenders are not comfortable giving funding to MSME sector. So an innovative solution like credit guarantee mechanism could be brought about for MSME to kickstart this solar rooftop sector. And secondly, again, look at India. India has recently launched some of the innovative policies on manufacturing, on solar and wind and other sectors, which in this scenario is going to kickstart the economy and also bring about jobs. I believe these are some of the innovative policies. I also caught up with Jan van Zulen, the founder of the Africa Solar Industry Association, to find out what the challenges and opportunities are for energy companies operating in the African market. Firstly, I asked John, how can solar energy help African countries meet their growing energy needs? I then asked John, what role will the private sector play in developing solar energy across the African continent? This is what he had to say. In my opinion, there's really like three main aspects on which solar energy can help African countries. First of all, 80% of the electricity generated in Africa comes from fossil fuel, notoriously more expensive. And nowadays, with the most recent prices of solar energy, we are really reaching very, very low prices. That would be number one. Another way is by making the best use of decentralized generation and stabilizing the grids. Many countries in Africa have this issue of unstable grids and by multiplying the solar installations along the grid, it's one possible way to, to stabilize the, the energy supply, especially if you think of adding storage capabilities uh, on top of the solar. And then last but not least, electricity access. There's an estimated 800 million people in the world that do not have any access to electricity. 
and 600 million of those live in Africa. Now, this being said, this is not inevitable because through the many solar innovations, among which solar home systems or mini grids, it's actually possible to reach those people faster than by extending the traditional national grid and thus provide them with the basic electricity services thanks to solar energy. The private sector will continue playing the role it has already been playing over the past years. And the private sector is already very present on, on many fronts. For example, if you think of the large-scale projects, well, IPPs have been around for many years, and there's really no reason for this to change in the future. It's a successful method of uh, generating electricity and providing electricity to users. IPPs are, however, facing a challenge in the sense that there is a limited number of really large-scale opportunities because of technical limitations of the grid. But again, with the evolution of storage technologies, I expect the private sector to gradually come up with more innovative approaches. And that's really what the private sector is about. They need to come up with solutions. If you look at the CNI segments, commercial and industrial, well, there not so long ago, an AFSIA member, Empower New Energy, released a study identifying that solar energy through standalone installation is already cost competitive with the grid in roughly 15 African countries. So in these countries, solar projects can be undertaken fully by the private sector and, of course, provided the appropriate policies are present in the country to allow for such installations. But there, it could also be driven purely by the private sector. Last thing, solar home systems and mini-grids, there also the private sector has been playing a crucial role for the past decades, coming up with a very innovative direct current-based solutions, providing the solutions to the 600 million Africans who, who do not have electricity access, like I mentioned before. Every day they are coming up with new projects, new solutions to bring electricity to more people. So private sector is already very active and it will continue to be so. Finally, I asked John, what are the key challenges facing investors and energy firms developing solar energy in Africa? And what can governments do to facilitate the development of an efficient and sustainable renewable energy sector? The challenges faced by investors are different based on the, the segments that they play in. If you look at the large-scale project segment, for example, well, one of the challenges there is the limited number of projects and also the tender processes that can take a very long time. So sometimes it can be discouraging for some of the investors. Also, another challenge that they face is even though the, the need is there and even though the grid could actually absorb a large-scale project, there is an issue with necessary guarantees and the risk sharing for such long-term projects. And what we have seen, unfortunately, is that many of the large-scale projects that are being developed, unfortunately, never really uh, reach uh, fruition because of many blocking factors along the road. In terms of governments, I think there's really three main things that they could do. First of all, and it's understandable, but the solar industry evolves very, very quickly. And it's sometimes difficult for governments to stay up to date with the latest innovations, the latest solutions that are available in the market. So there maybe could be helpful if, if there was a platform maintaining a more regular and continued conversation between developers and between manufacturers and governments. So there is always a mutual understanding of what is currently possible and what are the latest innovations. Second thing, uh, which I believe could be very helpful, is if governments would make some limited amounts of local currency financing available for local developers. That would help them get started with a few projects, build experience and build track record, and then be ready to speak to international investors who are looking for those bigger portfolios. And then final thoughts, which I believe could definitely help professionalize the industry, is if local governments were to think about ways to bring a bit more standardization, training and certification of the local players that would help local SMEs deliver better quality products, but better services as well, recognized services, and that would help bring a lot more trust in the industry and hence a lot more projects. While developing renewable energy capacity is a key part of reducing carbon emissions, 
If the targets of the Paris Energy Accord are to be met, improving efficiency on the demand side will play a key part of this. When I caught up with Anthony Ablaza, the CEO of Climergy and the co-chair of the Asia-Pacific ESCO Industry Alliance, I was keen to find out what was being done in Asia to improve efficiency. Firstly, I asked Alexander, what are the easiest ways utilities and governments can improve energy efficiency? Utilities governments have a huge role in catalyzing about $16 trillion between now and 2040. And this is because policy reform, fiscal incentives, structures, forced obsolescence of government technology, for example, will make this happen in the next 20 years. Governments have started to look at energy efficiency as a primary resource in the energy mix. This hasn't happened yet, not even in the developed markets. But this is the pathway in the next 10 years that government should take. Treat energy efficiency as infrastructure, treat them as a primary energy resource alongside fuels and renewables and all other energy sources for the global economy. I then asked Alexander for his thoughts on would COVID-19 help or hinder energy efficiency programs? This is what he had to say. It's interesting that COVID-19 is shaking up our energy markets. I'd like to make that very strong conclusion that post-COVID-19, the whole world will not be returning to the pre-COVID-19 energy consumption, and energy intensity based lights. No, we won't. We'll be packing less people in trains. We'll be making more car trips. We'll be packing less people in buildings and industrial plants. Our energy intensity will definitely go up. And I think the whole world will just have to double time right now and catch up with the pre-COVID-19 baselines. So what COVID has done is to raise the urgency of energy efficiency investments and implementation. Even those that are already on the green pathway will have to play catch up right now. But here's the interesting thing. COVID-19 has the opportunity of making energy efficiency actually a stimulus activity. And this is very consistent with the pronouncements of the International Energy Agency. In the, in, in the Philippines, for example, we have demonstrated that for the same amount of stimulus or investment, you create 45% more jobs than normal infrastructure projects, whether energy, transport, or water. 45% more jobs. In the United States, 45 to 55% of new jobs in the energy sector were actually in energy efficiency, outsizing those of renewables, oil and gas, and power sector. So energy efficiency should be seen as a stimulus in the post-COVID-19, and it should be able to correct the post-COVID-19 distortions made by the pandemic. I also asked Alexander, how important is private sector financing to energy efficiency programs? Private sector capital will always push the lion's share of the $24.5 trillion that IEA estimates between now and 2040. While government is there to seed it, while development funders and climate funds are there to seed it and they risk it, the lion's share will still be mobilized by private sector. And this will have to be done through modalities, through policy frameworks that would de-risk private sector investments. I would say that if $16.5 trillion will have to flow through new products, new financial services, new financing modalities, new procurement methods, new financial structures. Take for example, how can we use private capital for public sector energy efficiency? And this is enabling, like in many countries in Asia, many governments cannot actually procure ESCO performance contracts. Or how do we enable PPPs or public-private partnership for a bundle, let's say, of 100 government building retrofits? Or, or how do we engage private sector and government-owned companies entering into joint venture agreements for energy efficiency retrofits. So there's huge opportunity here to play around with innovative financial structures, products, and services that will enable debt 
equity and guarantee investments to push the $16.5 trillion between now and 2040. So yes, while government and climate funding there to enable the market to spark the catalytic action, still private sector at the end of the day that will deliver the lion's share. To wrap up, I asked Alexander about the importance of government regulation in allowing energy efficiency programs to flourish. Our government plays a huge role. Every market has that normal behavioral market inertia, right? If there's no carrot, if there's no stick, the market will transform very slowly through time. You need to crack the whip. We need to dangle carrots. We need new structures. You know something that's never, almost never done? We need governments to actually finance the accelerated or forced obsolescence of low efficiency technologies. A decade ago, how do we get incandescent bulbs out of the global market? We're past incandescent bulbs right now. There's so much cooling, air conditioning, refrigeration, motors that have to be washed out of the markets and governments play a role in setting the policy framework as well as mobilizing financing to wash these technologies away from the market. So yes, policy and regulation play a huge role because without that policy framework, things will happen very slowly and we will not meet our 2030-2040 targets. So that's it for our special edition Energy and Utilities Market Talk. I'm Andrew Roscoe, Editor of Energy and Utilities. I'd like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to welcoming you soon. Don't forget to check out energy-utilities.com for all the latest news, analysis and expert commentary in the global energy sector. Until next time, goodbye.